test, test, computational storage, computational storage processing. Stop listening to Stephen. <laughs> Stop listening to Stephen. <laughs> Look at the dot. <laughs> I love no load. <laughs> Look into my eyes. <laughs> I like uh, real products. Oh, I've got a real product. We, I, have a real pro I have a real product. Thank you very much. <laughs> Where is it? Mine's a little oh, bigger. I don't actually. <laughs> we all brought them. That's awesome. Damn. That's oh, I do. Bigger. I do. Hang on. Yeah, I'm not going to let that one Smaller's fly. Smaller's better. <laughs> Fuck. All right. We're having way too much. It is 4 o'clock on a Friday. Folks. I know. Fucker. Thank you all for being here. I have a real product. Thank you very much. Oh, you found it. <laughs> <laughs> Are we doing a live demo? I don't know. Oh, we want to walk over to Xilinx so we can do a you, live you demo. say it's functional. Yeah. yeah. Not right. anymore. Yeah. Here, I can I got, I got a little arm core thing in here oh, we can plug oh, it into. Oh, boot it up on NVMe. Yeah. All right. Go ahead. <laughs> Fire us up. We are missing one, but missing one. Well, I think we should just get started. People get started want to talk. And, and, and yeah, he'll, he'll show up. Yes, we have a few questions ready uh, for the panel, but we also want to Pass the mic out to you guys for questions from the audience as well. Right over there. So. Making use of it. <laughs> oh, there is a mic on the side. I don't know if that works, but if you have questions, maybe that's the best place to go. Everyone ready? Yes, let's pass the mic. We'll do intros, so we'll skip us. Uh, Shahar Noy from Marvel. I was, I uh, want to say, uh, almost, know, almost, almost airlifted here because uh, our guy, our like resident for the computa computational storage, Noam, is a bit under the weather, so he couldn't attend today. So I replace him. We have the same accent, so you guys um, get, <laughs> there you go. get used to I this. To me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you shouldn't say. <laughs> nice to have you. Since, since the um, protocol for competition or is, is agnostic. It could be Ethernet just as much as it could be anything else. So oh, like that. So we're here. My name is Steve Bates. I'm the CTO of Adeticom. We're doing NVMe computational storage processors. And we'll talk a little about what they are as we go through the panel. Thank you. And I'm Scott Shadley. I work for NGD Systems. We're also a computational storage drive manufacturer. And we'll, again, if you didn't see this morning, you'll hear about that a little bit more as we go on. Uh, and I'm also the current chair of the SNEA Working Group. My name is Thad Omura. I'm the uh, EVP of Marketing and Operations for Scaleflux, a uh, provider of computational storage drives. Nice emphasis there. Yeah. All right. So the, the idea to move computation closer to storage has been there for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, you know us. We're boring. We're good. <laughs> Jason, Georgie. Project yeah. H for storage. Exactly. OCD. Yeah. <laughs> So this idea has been out for a while, but in the last 18 to 24 months, startups all over the place, many of you are sitting right here, have come up. So why is that? I think, well, okay. well, take yeah, sure. yeah. I'll take a shot. Oh, my word. Yeah. We practiced really I, well. I'm going to take this one. You're going to take the mic. <laughs> I think there's a couple of things. So one is logistically, why is the computational storage twig now formed, and why do we have 30 plus members companies and 100 plus member people? And I think that side of it is because we have been, a bunch of us came together and we went, okay, things are changing in terms of computers aren't getting faster, uh, single threaded performance isn't getting better, IO keeps getting faster, these fuckers in the ethernet space keep doubling the bandwidth all the fucking time. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah. And, and so we ended up to the point where the, the what I call the biorhythms of compute, the ability to either move, process, or store data has got it's shifted from what it was a little while ago, and that means computer architectures need to be tweaked a bit. And one way to tweak them is, rather than moving the data everywhere, is to process the data where it sits. And that's where computational storage kind of comes from. You know, on a more personal level, us three got together as three startups and went, we would like to start putting some you know, rigor around this from a standards, from an ecosystem point of view. And we had a 7 a.m. flash memory summit, bird of a feather, which we thought the three of us would turn up to, slightly hungover, very hungover in my case. But uh, we had a packed room, and we kind of went from there. Snea very gratefully blessed it. And now we have something you know, that we can all go work around. And I'm going to stop now, because I'll talk to you later. Yeah, so let I me add on. I didn't wake up in that morning. And still, <laughs> still, <laughs> hungover. I was the only one missing, so, yeah, so he still remembered it to me. So this is why I keep saying it's three and not four. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Just from a market perspective, though, I mean, there, what we've seen as Scaleflux in, out there from a market demand is the rise of 
these data-driven applications. So in the uh, keynotes, you see how much data is being created, right? And what the desires of a lot of the customers now is to make that data active, is to actually be able to go through it all. But you can't go through it all in today's server processor paradigms where all the data has to move up to a central processing complex for analysis or manipulation. And so the whole idea behind computational storage is to address this huge market demand to be able to process the data at a much lower latency, parallelize the workloads, better application performance, better user experience. And, and to kind of add to that from an NGD perspective, uh, we've all been around and doing this for more than just the last year, 18 months, 24 months. In our case, 2013 is when we founded the company to kind of work at it. There were some early products that were announced by other vendors that aren't here today that didn't take off because they were using different protocols, say a SATA drive or something like that. And there's, there's some protocol limitations when it comes to what you use. So PCIe has been something that's helped make it viable for this to work because it gives us the throughput capability. And to add on to what Thad talked about, the, it's the storage uh, memory uh, paradigm that we're running into. If you've got 256 gig of DRAM in your server, that's very expensive to begin with, but that's as much as you can fit. But you can now get a petabyte of storage with that. The, the ability to read a petabyte of data into 256 gig of RAM, analyze it and flush it and redo it, takes hours. And that just doesn't work anymore. So computational storage and the ability to pre-screen, pre-test, do data analytics, whatever you need to do on that petabyte, allows you to solve that problem. I can, again, I represent a big company, so we do a lot of market research because before we're becoming innovators, right? There is, like, it's not secret that data is the new oil, right? All of you in this room know that data, if, if a company, if we give enterprise or cloud guys the ability to access data in a much more intelligent way, they can use it for their own competitive advantage. There's a fascinating graph from Facebook, which is public, public that shows you how much traffic goes into Facebook, like from, from users, and how much traffic is, is being diverted inside Facebook. You don't even see the traffic that goes into, into uh, Facebook. It's like such a small blip on the chart. Everything else is just the traffic in between. So what we see going forward is that there is a need for a comp computational storage next to the storage to be able to analyze the data. There is, I think, a data point from IDC that still tells us that we are accumulating data faster than our ability to analyze it. So how we improve the analysis stage, right? How we get computational closer to the storage and help to make the data more intelligent to help us on business decisions. And so Scott, thanks for the primer early this morning. <laughs> Very early this morning. Yeah. Um, <laughs> hopefully now There's something forward. about computational storage and start and end, but yeah. never in the middle for yeah. some reason. Yeah. <laughs> Very odd. So w maybe you can give us some use cases or examples. How do you think about computational storage, whether it's in an end device or is it an offline expo? an embedded accelerator that it's not in the media itself. You brought up both of those this morning. Yeah, so since I like to hear myself talk. Um, yeah, so the idea is, you know, when we think about it, if you embed it into the device like a computational storage drive, as we defined as a product that offers compute inside a storage device that still has persistent memory, i.e. NAND in our case, in most cases for the products today, um, the, the real net of what the value comes from it isn't by a single drive. And a single drive will still show acceleration and show the capability to manage. But when you put a bunch of them in a platform, you get the parallelism and the ability to overcome. In, in reality, you can have faster processing capability than even the CPU that's in the system. And so being able to do that in the storage plane is, is a significant value and why I you know, would focus on it from that perspective. If you think about it from a processor perspective or an offload, we have all these cool things that are on the PCIe bus with GPUs and everything for inline. We talk about in memory which is great, and memory is wonderful for things, but again, you're limited by the amount that you can sit in that space or on that plane by way of physical server space limitation for DIMMs and things like that. So putting a computational storage processor into a storage bay where you have those bays available, because generally there's gonna be at least one slot you can make work, you can add in one, two, three, 24 processors and get additional support, but it's now in the storage plane, and that's why we'd call it a computational storage processor. So maybe for the panel, maybe some of you can share some interesting use cases or applications of this that you've either been prototyping or shipping with customers. Sure. I mean, uh, one of the big focuses for ScaleFlux has been uh, database acceleration. And we see that because, one, uh, there is a huge amount of data going into it, which is fits characteristic number one. And number two, the desire to be able to analyze that data at the lowest possible latency is there and delivers a real... Uh, uh, end user benefit 
and is actually equatable to, to dollars, uh, the faster you can do it. So uh, database has been um, one, of the, one of the key focuses for Scaleflux in addition to big data applications. But certainly the market is just getting going. We see content delivery, AI and ML. Those are going to be, to us, the, 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 the growth paths. And in the, in the meantime, focus on database. And from a, another example of use cases, to his point, uh, we've seen from our perspective of our engagement, we've uh, been had the luxury or, or detriment, if you will, of dealing with the AI space. So it's a, it's a buzzword, we get that, but there's a lot of opportunity there. Uh, we've done things in the genomics space around AI and being able to process protein sequencing and things like that using those types of algorithms. Image similarity search, which is using an AI, AI algorithm from Facebook, is one that we've talked about openly many a times from our perspective. And so there's lots of opportunity in those spaces as well, because they're all large data sets that need to be analyzed. And generally, they're not in any, any form of a structured data set either, because you're getting inputs from so many different places, different file sizes, different file types, and being able to process locally and not have to you know, aggregate that in memory has been a big benefit. So I, you know, I think um, the, <coughs> the applications we see are kind of fall into three groups. So we're going to market initially, and we're in pre-production trials with numerous companies using low-level um, storage function acceleration. So that's kind of the legacy things that we've done in the past, but in, in a rather new and interesting and hopefully much more open and vendor agnostic way around things like compression, erasure coding, you know, RAID and so forth, dedupe, et cetera, et cetera. But to be honest, that's really just getting starting. I think where it gets more interesting is you know, some of the applications the other panelists have mentioned. So we're starting to see a lot of traction around um, you know, more structured data acceleration like databases, for example. So the ability to either perform database data services or to actually start integrating with the database itself and providing some of those database functionalities closer to the storage. And then the third one is analytics, of which, of course, AI is the huge monster right now. But there's also things like image processing, image recognition, and, and, and text recognition, and speech as well. So those are all areas that are growing. And I think one of the things that's a little different, you know, in terms of people who are doing that in, in, the, in the past or even right now is that with computational storage, we have the ability to start working on a common way of doing this. And I think for me, that's really important. The fact that we can align on certain APIs and certain points where those APIs should exist, it means that his products and his products and my products and his products and his products and your products <laughs> hopefully all conform to that same API. That means we get commonality, that means we get an ecosystem, and it means anyone in the room who's an end consumer of all this can actually start worrying more about whether yours is faster or lower power or whatever, rather than trying to worry about whether the fucking driver loads into the fucking Jeez. kernel that we got. Sorry. <laughs> Two <laughs> F-bombs. Two F-bombs. <laughs> well, let's talk about commonality. I'll tie this in as well for everybody. So when we think about security, something's encrypted. How do you deal with that? How are you going to stay common to these interfaces to all these different devices, whether it's the controllers or the end product? Can you go back? Do you want to try or you? you he, he didn't get a chance on the app. Do, so, do I have the option uh, to call a friend? Can I call Norm? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I will do for you guys. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. you know, I think encryption and storage devices is something that's been worked on for a long time, right? And so computational storage will certainly leverage anything that's going on there. So we have things like self-encrypting drives. That's going to be a little problematic for computational storage because the compression is done down there. I think we're going to have to think a little about distributed key management. If I do want a device to gather data from either the storage that's under it or the storage that's close to it, it's going to have to be able to access that data. It is going to have to authenticate itself to make sure that whoever is the root of trust knows that this is allowed to have the keys that you're going to give to it. And so we're going to have to look at distributed key management, which we're already looking at. We're going to have to look at device authentication. Well, there was a really good presentation on that by Kishagra running the Cerebrus project, how endpoints authenticate, right? I think these are all problems that are solvable, but they're problems that need to be tackled. And the computational storage work group is the place where that's going to start happening. Yeah, and from another perspective, if you think about it from a computational storage perspective, we're able to execute applications inside the devices, whether it be a fixed application, i.e. encryption, or a general purpose application where it's an OS, it's running the encryption algorithm that the user wants to use. It's not utilizing the, in, 
the embedded AES engine for self-encrypting drive, which means the user has to work around it. We're actually enabling the user's version of that security and encryption model to execute real time at the data level. So it's, it's not really so much of a problem as it is migrating it to where it's even more secure because all of your encrypted data is being managed by an encryption algorithm embedded in the device. There's no keys trading places, things like that. And that's one of the, the things that people overlook when it comes to security perspective is we're actually making things or can make things even more secure from that perspective. And I think that this is going to impact and the discussions in the security and the TWIG will impact certain different architectures and they're impacted differently by security. Some of us are going down a path of fixed function devices on the drive that are only executed by the host, in which it's a different problem than if there's a free running CPU on the drive that's able to do, you know, have new firmware downloaded and can execute something that's, that's malicious. So I think that those models are, there's many different models that we are attacking and going after from a, from a product perspective, and that are, that's gonna have big impact. But of course, at some point, there's going to be encryption engines in these computational storage drives that will be able to do that seamlessly in terms of the bulk encryption decryption. Okay, so so far we had the easy questions, the pre <laughs> uh, You know, we had a cheat. They got to look at them before. Yeah. So I'd like to open up for the audience to now start asking questions. We had a questions. yeah, we had a description early this morning of the effort that's going on in SNEA, and here we have you know three of the main companies that have been trying to put this technology into the market. This is your chance to drill them. <laughs> oh, hey. oh, we got one in the back too. Oh. You, you knew oh, this right, was we're coming. We're in trouble now. No, no. There you go. No, you, you knew this was coming though. Um, <laughs> for you, George. <laughs> <laughs> or for you, you you're you're on the top now. Um, we've talked here a lot about SSDs and the, the the enormous growing culture of cat videos and and other bits of data that are really important out there for us to be processing and dealing with. Where do hard drives fit into this world of smartness that's coming? Where does it fit? Yes, sir. So, you know, we had a presentation from uh, Microsoft earlier on telling us how hard disk drives are here to stay. And the cat videos are going to be in the hard drives. Exactly. But they might not be processed in the hard drive. Um, some of the difficulties that we've had with the concept of computational storage and some of the things that I guess they haven't mentioned before have to do with the fact that in a solid state device, you often find bottlenecks in the interfaces upstream from the bandwidth available from NAND dies into the internal processing SSDs. When you go into rotating media, that's not typically the case. The actual getting data off of the media is the bottleneck, and the interface is much faster than that. So a lot of the incentives to move compute closer to go on the other side of the bottleneck of data movement don't exist for HDD. So I'm not sure if it will go there or not. There are some granularities. Some might say that the move from you know, SANS with compute clusters into distributed compute is computational storage. It's just a matter of level and granularity. So to some extent, it happened already. In others, it may not make sense to go further. But I told you to grill them. <laughs> so, uh, Matthias stood up back there too. I think uh, we are not just talking about throughput, we are talking about the uh, amount of data. Right. Yeah, hard disk has much more amount of data. Well, that's not necessarily true anymore either. I mean, you, you can get an SSD product now. Yeah, from, from a dollar per gigabyte SSDs are never going to be equal to hard drive. We all know that. We, we've started doing we a dollar per IOP, watts per terabyte, whatever number you want just at a, a media level. But SSDs are now denser in smaller form factors than you'll ever get in a hard drive perspective. And being able to add the compute to them is the natural na next natural progression to be able to solve the problem. Because everybody's worried. Uh, there was a nice Anantech article that talked to today about or yesterday about nobody wants bigger than 16 terabytes because they're worried about a fault domain. Well, there's a lot of ways to overcome that fault domain, whether it be flash or spinning or otherwise, but computational storage devices have the ability to recover data more efficiently because you can run RAID, you can run other al applications within the drive itself and prevent those fault domains from being a problem. And now you've got 16, 32 terabytes per slot 
self-managed, self-searching, and you'd be able to give customers a benefit that they've never seen before? I think it's a lot about the workloads and where they are also stored. Obviously, Flash gives you better IOPS and latency, and so a lot of the applications we attack naturally gravitate towards the workload, uh, you know, hot data, warm data, or what have you, being already on Flash and are not on, on hard drives. And then there are models to accelerate hard drives separately with a computational storage device in a more accelerated model. So I think that's how you would, you would kind of take a look at hard drives with accelerators and uh, all flash with computational storage drives. There's also the infrastructure piece, right? Because HDDs, there's not a lot of changes to the HBAs as we know them. HBAs have compute capabilities. You can argue that, you know, at some stage when the standard can apply come to fruition, you can run some of those APIs, a similar mm -hmm. model on, on the HBA. There could be a case that uh, companies will rebuild some of the HDD infrastructure with like ARM processors or like some other capabilities and benefit from the same work that this group is working on. So there's a path to do computational HDD. There's a path to do computational tapes. Rate arrays, right. they have been doing it forever, right? Yeah. That's yeah. like yeah. computations yeah. processor and then the yeah. storage. I, I think that's a really good point that the, the APIs that we'll define will apply for different product categories, including things like computational storage arrays, which could be a whole bunch of HDDs with, like you said, a small ARM SOC at the front to manage them. That API could run on that ARM core. It could run at the interface to a CSD. It could run at the interface to a CSP. And if somebody implements that, it means the same verbs or actions or whatever we call them that we define in the working groups and push into standards can be applied against there. So now you can do interesting things like, you know, find me all of Tom's pictures of cat gifts, and when you're done, let me know where they are, and I'll come back and get them, right? And we can do that on the array, uh, which can troll an awful lot of data without interrupting the compute layer until it's ready to do so. So I definitely think there's potential for drives. Certainly, from what I'm seeing in the twig right now, it, the, the focus is on the faster velocity tier of storage, so the, the SSDs and so forth. But there's definitely potential for, for, for innovation there. Cool. So obviously, how does all zone namespaces fit into this? <laughs> but let's not go into that. <laughs> no, let's, let's Matthias. Let <laughs> So, yeah, th that's obviously a question I want to ask, but maybe, can you tell me a little bit about what is that we're going to standardize first? What is, th where are you going? Like, I see four companies and I see four ideas of how you want to see the world. <coughs> and I would really love to know, like, what is the first stage? What is it that we're going to get together on, standardize, and move forward with? Beyond the obvious, one slide on nomenclature. Yes. So, so I actually think <laughs> there's much more commonality about what we're trying to achieve than differences. I think the differences are in the way we go to market, but the thing that we actually want to work on in the twig is those APIs, and those APIs will be consistent across the product categories. So you can you know, write a driver or write a user space library or write an application that can use leverage that commonality of verbs to get the same kind of action done at different you know, atomic groupings in, uh, or deployment level variants, basically. And for me, it's that commonality of software that's really the important part of the technical working group. It's not trying to put us in a, in a bucket or a box in terms of the thing you have to bring to market and what that looks like physically or how it performs or whether it's SSDs or HDDs. The purpose of the twig, in my opinion, is to get that, stamp, you know, get that ecosystem around a software stack that'll work just as well for his product as his product is mine as yours. And we can have that commonality. I think uh, the first thing that's kind of already been done and in play is just to define what the heck is computational storage, because a lot of people are like, that's just a mouthful of words, right? You know, what does it mean? And so I think we're, we've gone down that path to try to drive the industry at least behind a common understanding. There's an element of identifying these products in system to know that they're capable. And then I would agree with Stephen, like, you know, the common API level where we may under the covers be doing the acceleration differently, you know, with a different type of engine, whether it's with a general purpose CPU or with fixed engine or what have you. But can they integrate all easily into the software ecosystem? And that's what's critical to getting the, the technology mainstream. So I had a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, uh, 
So I heard, I, I attended the Denali talk yesterday, it was very interesting, and then I also um, heard some of you guys talk about some of your solutions, and it sounds like there's different granularities at which storage computation can be applied, whether it's right next to the NAND in the controller itself, or a PCI card added in, or a cluster uh, controller, or something like this. <coughs> and I'm wondering, what have you found, or what do you envision as being sort of the optimal place to put uh, the storage accelerate or the storage computation stuff. <laughs> um, the the rainbows over there. If you can find the pot at the end, I'll pay so you. So much so. for a happy family. Yeah, really. No, no, no. So you're very true. So the the, the trick again, kind of le leveraging off of what are we doing to make this a, a basic idea, is we are all going to do it differently. There's going to be a reason why each of these products are going to exist, whether they're going to coexist, compete, or just be used for their own unique purposes. But if you think about it from a hops perspective, you, you, one of the big things that you want to keep in mind is we all like latency now is our big thing. It's not the IOPS, it's not the throughput, it's the, the ability to manage a QoS. So the further or the more hops you create between your data and your, your end result of the CPU processing will be a problem or could be a problem depending on how you manage that. So if you've got a drive with a processor on the edge attached to something else, you could create more issues than you could solve. Whether for certain workloads, that may work just fine. In other ways, you can do it with single chip solutions. It doesn't really make that huge of a difference from that perspective, other than it, it allows customers that flexibility to basically choose which way they want to do it. And when they plug it in, it says exactly what it can do. The system knows exactly what it's capable of, and then they can execute the, the programming from there. And Paul, Paul, you mentioned you, you mentioned Denali, right? In between, like as uh, part yeah. of the confusion. I, well, yeah. I, well, I, seen the Denali talk. Was it Denali or was it Microsoft? Den Denali, yeah. 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 The, 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 Denali industry, the industry, yeah. I think what we find out is the industry tends to confuse. There's a couple of problems that we're trying to resolve, right? Denali tried to resolve, like, you know, how the data will be more optimized on, in route to the drive. SSDs are not efficient, right? SSDs is a black box. You send something. There, there's some block management. You push it down to the drive, and, you know, after a few years, you get end of, end of life, right? And it's not truly end of life. So this is, I think, the first big problem that the industry tried to resolve. Computational storage, I believe, and you guys can kick me out of this forum right <laughs> after, is that more, what do you do with the data after it resides on the drive, right? Like how do you manage it more effectively? Scott mentioned the kind of like drives are, are, are getting, getting bigger, like, you know, doing great on those drives is kind of like, like insane. My argument would go, and we're talking to a lot of customers all the time, that what you see 16 terabyte now, you will see 100 terabyte drives down the road, you will see 200 terabyte. You cannot avoid it, the fact that we need more data in less square footage. It costs a billion dollars to build a new data center. Facebook doesn't want to do that. Facebook want to squeeze more gigabyte into square footage. So we need to find a solution. How do we make those drives redundant without sending all the data back to the way we used to do it with RAID 5, RAID 6. If you talk to the industry right now about how you do redundancy in the old way, they, they kick you out of the window, they kick you out of the chimney, they kick you wherever, because <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. They pay so much money for NVMe drives, they pay so much money for all of this throughput, and then you bring a very old technology to try and make it kind of make, make the data redundant. So when you look into computational storage, how every each drive can help another drive to recover data, right? Those type of challenges that the industry sees, I think there's there's tons of value, which is again slightly different than what we're trying to resolve with Denali. Re the reason why I brought up Denali is I, I believe it was Michael Cromwell, yeah, was uh, sort of painting a vision of you know the next step beyond what you know the compression and other things is this cool concept of computational storage, and so that's. Why, uh, why I mentioned it, but. And I think that's a big part of the way Scaleflux sees it as well, which is this kind of, um, you know, the host is going to continue to run the main applications. And it's going to have the most visibility of all the storage that it's actually connected to. And so I think that's why uh, in the Microsoft Denali, that the first step is, you know, more control of where the data is placed in those things. But also understanding that data from the host perspective to be able to more intelligently operate compute functions at the drive level, to be able to send off those commands down to the drive. So in our, from our perspective, computational storage is uh, an evolution that will be based out of some of these Denali open channel types of flash management models. They do, they do tend to go hand in hand. Okay, thanks. Does that help? Yeah. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Perfect timing, actually, for the <laughs> next question, so. Want to sit here? <laughs> yeah, I don't bite. <laughs> <laughs> At least not yet. 
<laughs> so Anson showed uh, all the different form factors that we're coming up with now for Flash, the various CDSF form factors. Do you any limitations, any benefits with them, any challenges? What can you say about that? Uh, Current product, future product? Uh, yeah, so from a, a form factor perspective, EDSF seems to be the future of like OCP and the direction of the data center. Again, trying to cram more into less, as, as Shahar mentioned, you do need those newer form factors. There will be some limitations, if you will, to some implementations, depending on how far you're willing to take them. For example, for our ability to get into an M.2, we had to turn it into an ASIC. Is that the best path forward for computational storage? It has its benefits because I fit a form factor. There's also reasons why I might stick with an FPGA and keep it in a U.2, like my counterpart at ScaleFlux is doing today. So, and I'm sure you'll talk to it too. But um, those form factors really, it's just like any other SSD to a computational storage device, it's just a, a shape. How much can you cram into a given physical footprint? It doesn't impact what we can do with the capabilities that are embedded in the devices. So for, for us, you know, high bandwidth memory is really, really critical, right? And that puts us into a, a high-end Stratix, where we're, you know, we're working with Stratix 10. So it puts us into a high-end Stratix 10 and that requires a lot of power. Mm -hmm. And getting that down to a, like 70 watts or so, that's, that's viable for maybe a three inch form factor. That's our biggest worry is how do we get, you know, when you have like 25, whatever the number, the density of the FPGAs into that and the thermals and the power for that. But um, the, the thing with the, the you know, with the, there's lots of different workloads you could put on there, right? And the question would be is the, the FPGA or whatever the computational engine is would be, would be driven by what kind of workload you put on there, right? So the kind of scenarios I'm looking at could really leverage the, uh, the high bandwidth memory. But it doesn't mean that they have to have it, right? It just means that you wouldn't be able to run those things uh, as efficiently, perhaps the workloads that make sure in. So, so I think today we're just starting down this computational storage journey. And we've already seen certain you know, product offerings come out that try to put compute and storage in the same form factor. And that form factor it wasn't designed for that. And it's, it's getting rate limited. It's throttled because you're trying to do two things that consume 20 watts in a 25 watt form factor, right? So that's a problem, but it's one that's already been discussed. EDSFF, the working group, people on the working group of EDSFF were thinking about accelerators or computational storage elements at the same time they were thinking about SSDs. And on top of that, one of the things we did was to define a computational storage processor that doesn't have its own persistence because of exactly like issues like this. There are going to be occasions where you want to get a lot of work done and you want to maximize the thermals and the cooling of that form factor and you realize, well, when I do that, I got no room for persistence, but I still want to have my software API because I'm going to be right beside the storage and I need commonality of the software. And I think we're going to have to think about that. I think it will be interesting going forward whether computational storage devices or, or the work in the twig has to impact some of the form factor twigs. And I think that could be very interesting. And just to add to that, uh, computational storage is at a place where, you know, it, it says storage. It's got to fit in existing storage infrastructure today for it to be usable, consumable, and, and for people to deploy. So... Uh, today, it's you got a choice. It's like this nine watt, you know, M.2 thing, or it's like a 25 watt uh, of these things that are that are being designed. It absolutely is critical to understand the difference between storage I/O performance versus the compute you're putting in such a tight form factor. And these are the same issues that happened when flash uh, SSDs were starting to be deployed in two and a half inch drives or what have you way back when. But what has happened with Flash now? Now, the value of Flash is a little bit different. You see these longer EDSFF, uh, I, I can't get on. The, you, you see all these different form factors now evolving out of Flash because of different use case model and, and form factors. So I do think computational storage will very much follow that. There may be new form factors that drive a 75 watt because you want to balance way more on compute, potentially. But for today, there's no doubt it's got to fit in an existing storage form factor, whether it's U.2, PCA card, EDSF, uh, yep. EDS, thank you. Sorry. Well, so so okay. you mentioned earlier, you have a, you have a U.2, you have an M.2. You claim, if 70 watts, you're not fitting in either of those form factors. 
And then even in the EDSF form factor family, there's E1.S, E1.L. Do you think that there are too many form factors coming out? Are you going to proliferate more form factors on top of that, different no. pinouts and requirements? No. Yes. yes. Well, the answer Not should now. be no, so hopefully we can find a way that... No, the we'll answer should be yes, but later. Yes. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so well, computational storage devices are going to stay in the family of SMTs for the most part, just by default, whether it's a processor is still going to fit in that same form factor. Well, keep it simple, stupid. Don't go do something completely so off the wall to that point that when you bring it out, people are like, oh, that's really cool, but I can't do anything with it. So yeah, we're going to stick with the same form factors. Maybe as we start developing it more, the SFF organization is now part of SNEA. The twigs can work together. If we develop a new common, better foot form factor, great. If not, we're going to continue to have the U.2s, the M.2s, the EDSFs. So I, I wasn't saying it would be, have to be that exact wattage. I mean, I was just saying is yeah. that yeah. Uh, a higher wattage, like in a, you know, if you look at the three-inch ESDFS form factor, the long one, right? Uh, it gives you a lot more room for thermals and a lot more space for, you know, uh, the different kinds of uh, the memories you may want to put on an FPGA. So the, the real thing I think is important is the, what are you going to do with this thing, right? And, and that's going to drive so many aspects of it, right? So if, if, you, if you're driving it by, by unique workloads and you understand the characteristics of the workloads, then, you, you know, in certain cases, you know, if, if you don't need the high bandwidth memory, you can get away with a, a much simpler compute Right, then you know, you're reformatting, doing compression or whatnot, then, then these, uh, uh, you know, the, the other one, the U.2 is great, right? I, I have a, a super micro U.2 storage array, I can just plug it in there and go. So, uh, I think the only thing I want to say is the only problem you can't solve with one more form factor is too many form factors. There, you go. <laughs> there, there is maybe again an, another angle we, we bring from a big company, a company that has a portfolio of like both storage and networking. We do believe that right now you pay a lot of a compute inside your storage rack just for connectivity. If this will go away, if we can go Ethernet to the drives, we have the vision of doing that, you can benefit even more for a small computational piece per drive. Now, in this case, you can completely eliminate your 125 watts, 200 watts type of processor at the back plane, so you're ending up in having an EDSFF with much better airflow, and each EDSFF has a, li this, a small compute piece into that, so the thermal management of those uh, form factor will be much more easier for any type of, of designer. Okay, we have one more from the audience here. Then we have one in the back. Yeah, one in the back. Yeah. I can look. I can, you can finish that first. <laughs> related, <laughs> what? Like, all all back. <laughs> related to uh, your your discussions there, I, I you know, in thinking about the different kinds of uh, computational elements that could be put into this thing, uh, you know, FPGA is starting to mind. I can imagine putting a, a small GPU in a small form factor. I can imagine a multi-core CPU or multi-core you know chip. Um, what are what are the advantages and disadvantages of these different types of of things that, that you're seeing, and uh, why would you advocate for one versus another? Can I take that? So, um, in our case, we're building a, uh, um, a volumetric renderer and a fluid simulation engine. So we're, we're starting with the computational workload and driving it out. So to answer that question, you have to look at the memory access patterns, right? Um, some memory access patterns are, are so random, so when you do the light transport uh, path tracing, right? inside of a volumetric cloud for smokers, whatever, right? Uh, that process is so random accessy, right, that you're gonna stall the GPU, right? It, it's gonna be constantly stalled. Now, you can do for certain kinds of shots, you can use the GPU, but if you're doing things that are, uh, are you know, are so much random, you know, random access all the time, what ends up happening is you use the GPU in certain instances where, like, you know, like if you see NVIDIA demos, you, you always see cars. You ever wonder why? Because you know the cars don't move, you don't have light sources that are moving around. You don't have crazy clouds where you're you know reflecting and refracting the light inside the cloud. So when you have things like that, then the memory access pattern is all over the damn place. So for things like that, FPGAs make a, a lot of sense if you can feed it. On the GPU side, if you're largely contiguous in memory, right? So there are certain workloads that we have when we're processing over the image or using some kind of AI workload to make the convergence of the Monte Carlo integration faster, right? For those kind of things, either using a, a, a neural processor or using a, a GPU that has that, that kind of thing integrated in it is great, right? So it, it always goes back to the characteristics of the workload. The other thing that becomes really, really important 
is sometimes, you know, you might be doing a lot of work, but then doing very short messages that are doing like a, a, a synchronization, right? So what's really happening is you have these, uh, between your partitions, right? You have these regions where you're doing, uh, you know, there's, there's a, a bi-directional message passing going on. And those are lightweight, tiny messages. So in a lot of computational engines, they're great at streaming and chunking away, right, data parallel. But all of a sudden, when you have lightweight, tiny little messages, they break down, right? Yeah. So it always goes back down to the, what are you going to do with this thing? And, and to kind of circle it, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but to circle it back around to kind of what Jorge mentioned as well around the, the protocol versus the internal bus bandwidth changes. So that has a lot to do with what you want to stick in that device. If you're talking PCIe Gen 3 by 4 we know it's 3.2 gigabytes per second. So if I can do anything faster than that inside the drive, which at a CFX or CFI level, where I'm talking the NAND component to the, CP, to the internal controller, it's almost 16 gigabytes per second. Why wouldn't I use that bus instead of the three gigabyte bus outside? Same thing could be said for a GPU complex or whatever else. You just look at the protocols, which part's talking to which part, wherever it's faster, that's where you're gonna wanna put this compute capability because you're gonna get the most benefit from it. And we've taken a, an approach where um, the, the workloads that we target are definitely more of the fixed function orientation things. Very simply, if x86 sucks, you, if you're not doing those, you're, you want to do it in a more fixed function engine. And there's a couple, not, not only from a performance benefit, because it is work to move it down to a different place. And there's a lot of validation. Okay, so it's not just the development work. I mean, it's validation of all the test cases and what have you, which is time consuming. I think that's the, fir the first thing. And the second thing is um, you want to target um, those functions from a power perspective on the drive because you need to be able to execute. Again, we're back to the what power envelope of workload are we targeting on that 25-watt drive in addition to providing state-of-the-art NVMe level of read-write IOPS. So the computational storage drives today, you know, need to be able to support and plug into existing NVMe sockets that provide, you know, 700K, 800,000 IOPS, right? Because people are going to want to make sure you can run all the existing workloads on those drives in addition to the computational accelerated workloads as well. So with that problem, that's why we've taken the approach of more fixed function, things that, you know, um, essentially x86 sucks at, and move those closer to the data. And I think, in, in you know, as in addition to the data plane, there's also the control plane considerations, right? We, we, you know, if this goes gangbusters, like if we knock it out of the park, then there's going to be a lot of these puppies out there, and they need to be managed, and they need to be managed at scale, and that's Kubernetes, message, you know, that's, that's DMTF, right? And one of the really nice things about this is we are adding computation in an open way to the, compute, to the storage layer, but the storage layer already has a great management infrastructure. It's always been a lot of priority on managing your storage, and we can tie into that, and that's going to be a, you know, a pretty big part of what we're doing here. So how does having an open ecosystem, whether it's hardware or software platforms here at Open Compute, how does that help you? How does that get you moving faster I got to start there. Can I start this? <laughs> it doesn't help us. It helps you, the yeah. consumer. <laughs> Makes our life. Accurate. He's been waiting all day to say I'm, that. I'm going to get into trouble for it saying this, but us. we got to make this consumable by idiots, right? <laughs> we got to make it so easy for people to consume computational storage that they plug it into their system, and the power goes down and the performance goes up, <laughs> and they're like, "Wow." Like, how did that happen? I took out an SSD, I put in a CSD or a CSP, power went down, performance went up, quality of service got better. I like what these guys are selling. Yeah. I, it's got to get to that point. And OCP is the place to do it? OCP could be the place OCP. to do it. Could, could be, could be. <laughs> Just getting back to the question. <laughs> He's not a pain member at the moment. Yeah. So he had a, sorry, sorry. He had a question. So, just one interjection real quick. So um, one of the things that's kind of important as we try to abstract and layer, layer on top of this, right, is sometimes things that are really, really simple, right, uh, they can actually be very, very fast too, right? And uh, um, if, if you look at it, it's like if we put the containers and all of the different layers on top of this API, we come up with some standardized API, 
you know, some work we did where we built a user mode driver to just talk directly to the NVMe controller. Um, we over doubled the performance of the uh, of the drive. Now, the 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 point would be is is uh, we just have to be cognizant that uh, you know if performance really matters, right? We have to be very careful by by having layer upon layer upon layer upon layer of this stuff, right? Because it might be easy to program, but it might defeat the purpose because the amount of latency you have through the layers overweigh the value add of the uh, of the computations going on there. That's the only caveat. And I, I, I've experienced this, you know, in a DMA engine a, long, a while back in, in an FPGA. The the software drivers that went through the the kernel. I mean, that they put uh, it was. You know, it was out there, was in the Linux tool chain, but when you actually try to use it, 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 it added so much latency that the, the, the DMA talking to the, uh, the you know, the scratch pad. I, I guarantee the so NVMe driver won't do that. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just saying is it's, it's just, it was so slow that you didn't even use it. So if we do the same kind of thing, we has to be super lightweight that, you know, you're not adding more latency than your... Uh, and and we may or may not want to discuss that within OCP. <laughs> <laughs> Bring you back to the question. <laughs> okay, we have one more audience. Yes, please. Oh dear God, you gave me the microphone. Yes. Um, <laughs> earlier discussion about using Ethernet as an interconnect, because there's probably more bandwidth there than PCIe. There's also less cable limitation for distance limit problems. Is there any reason why a device individually couldn't? run like a clustered file system or run entire file system and talk to multiple hosts directly as opposed and basically remove your classic storage head is there any reason why not i mean i'm assuming there might be some limits for how much processing power there is on 18 millimeters by 200 yeah. but could you pack like an entire file system into it so each individual device could handle a clustered file system or a clustered workload. And so you add a drive, you add another drive, and you don't add a storage controller. All your connectivity is Ethernet. Yeah. We have openings. We're hiring. So if, uh, <laughs> we, need, we need this type of vision Great, in our job. group. <laughs> but, but you just walked it's, yourself it's into true, a job. It's, it, it's, like it's part of the vision we have, part of like, you know, the flexibility that we want to provide. Because data center is all about utilization. And I apologize, there's no other sexy world to, to, word to use it right now. It's all about utilization, right? And, 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 and the more we can do with less, right, the more we can scale. It's not just about the upfront saving to the data center. It's like how they can use, like, uh, we'll give an example, a big East Coast OEM. You go into their lab, you see all the storage arrays that they have, and they have holes inside the rack. And like, why you guys don't fill it up? We don't have enough power budget in the rack to put more, more shelves. Can we cut on a compute, right? Please, can we distribute the compute in a more effective way? So you're absolutely right. This is part of like, this is where we, we see where the industry, where Ethernet, compute, all comes together in a slightly different way than we used to do it. It's no longer centralized, big compute, but compute being distributed to assist with those kind of like activities. Yeah, and, and from that perspective, to your point around running OSs and file systems on the drives, those are definitely things you can do with our concepts of the general purpose. So, for example, I, I run a Linux and a I can run a Linux or a clustered file system on each of the drives today. I am gated today by NVMe, but that doesn't preclude that when we have the Ethernet capabilities involved or whatnot to actually deliver and communicate directly without requiring any kind of a storage controller and stuff. So those are logical progressions of this as we develop the infrastructure, but again, Near term, keep it simple, stupid, make it easy to use. As those, those standards and those capabilities evolve through companies that are developing the Ethernet side of it, that absolutely becomes a viable option. And there's some examples in the market today with like on the edge space where we're starting to see the edge put extremely lightweight infrastructure in place, but have a lot of data movement going on around it, and we can help with those as well. And so Azure IoT Edge was a good example of one of those that you can actually talk to a drive and eliminate the host controller altogether. One use scenario is uh, today's uh, storage going to distributed uh, storage system, and they are object object storage, and they are sharded. Yeah, I'm wondering whether the computational storage can be applied in this scenario. Well, yeah. So to your point, sharding is a solution that exists today to overcome or try to overcome the problem that we're solving without having to shard the data. 
So if you are sharding data across multiple drives, even if each drive has compute capability, since the complete file's not in place, until we have peer-to-peer -peer working fully, which some products in the processing world do, or the drives do, you're actually gonna have to go back to a traditional architecture. So sharding is not something that is currently, I guess, scoped within the concept of computational storage, but if you properly enable computational storage with the solutions that are coming, you will no longer need to shard your data, is basically what I'm coming to. I'm actually gonna argue with you there in the sense that, <laughs> I mean, part of what the, well, the computational storage twig is going to define APIs, and those APIs will occur on boundaries. And some of those boundaries may be between CSPs, CSDs, and NVMe, or whatever storage devices. So if something is sharded, we will have verbs defined to help get the data from where it is to one place. So maybe if you have multiple CSDs, you can orchestrate between the CSDs to get all the data from the shard to one CSD to do the processing that you need. You know, maybe that's not as efficient as if all the data had to be on that CSD, but if a customer wants to shard, they will shard, right? <laughs> and, and we need to be able to fix that. So computational storage twig will be thinking about that. How do we, how do we get the data from where it is to where it needs to be? And that may be across CSDs. And there may be you know, APIs that are device to device Right, and I see Martin's head shaking because in an operating system environment, that means taking thing, things happening the OS didn't even know it's happening. Or maybe there's an orchestration that occurs so that somebody says, go get all this data. Once you've got it, do this processing. And by the way, raise an interrupt when you're done so I know it's done and I can come get the result. So. <laughs> it wouldn't be fun without a little bit of contention. Right? Question, about, uh, question about the ecosystem. So you guys have uh, nice devices, but to fully utilize, customer has to modify application, like uh, MySQL or RocksDB. So uh, what kind of activity is going on to uh, improve the ecosystem? And how, how long it will take actually customer fully utilize your uh, the smart assets? As long as everyone follows the Adeticom API, we're oh. already done. <laughs> <laughs> Barf, barf. We're going to have fun now. Um, Wait a minute, the, and, and everything's all done for it? Is that? So <laughs> that, that's part of the progression of the ecosystem. The, the progression is we have to start at the base layer. I plug it in, what can it do? Now I know what it can do. So in our case, we have an API or we have an SDK that helps the user migrate the application appropriately. They've got their API. He's got his variant of the same thing where something's got to be done today to a host system to make them fully uti utilizable. We understand that. The trick is to make that as common as we can as we progress forward. Because on the host side layer, to, to Thad's point earlier, we, at the end of the day, don't care. It's, it's kind of all the way back to the Fusion IO model. They had to rewrite something because nobody had done it before. We're trying to get ahead of that as a team and provide that to customers so they don't have 17 different versions of it coming to market at the same time and actually make it easier for users. So today, we don't have that solution. You're correct. Everybody will have to modify their host platform or the host application in some way to use each of these products. The goal of the efforts with standardization, the idea of going into the open project concept is to get it to a point where we're all using the same thing to execute what each drive has the, the benefit of doing. And I think this is exactly where OCP comes in because we're gonna have to do things in the operating systems for the discovery and so forth. We will have to do things in user space to create libraries right, where applications tie into the library. The, the ideal is that we do, you know, an open user space library, perhaps within OCP, right, we all work on that and provide a single API binding so that you only have to change the application once for computational storage. And at that point, it doesn't matter if you plug in his product or his product or my product or your product, the and application benefits no matter what. He's already, he's already there are there are also some workloads uh, that we've approached where we essentially uh, utilize the existing software APIs that already exist and would run on x86 as is and use that exact same API and utilize hardware to accelerate that particular function. So in that particular model, there's actually no standardization required to make that API, because it's already used in production by applications, and that's one of the reasons we've been able to get out to market with our solution quickly, is, is following this type of model for certain levels of acceleration. Now, for brand new things, there may need to be new APIs, and that's kind of where, where we need to go. This, uh, to answer the question in another way, 
we began this effort this morning at our early morning other end of the day meeting where we gave a call to action to the software companies. Come join us. Be a part of this effort. L let's work together to define how to solve your particular problems, whether it's machine learning, database acceleration, whatever. There are going to be issues that the software people have to deal with in terms of data locality. There are going to be issues we need to deal with in terms of orchestration to coordinate these processes across multiple uh, processor domains within, within a, a, a rack. How do we do all this? Bring us the problems. And right now we're heavily hardware driven. We got lots and lots of solutions. Bring us the problems. I think that's a perfect way to end it. Thank you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> thank the panel. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank all of you for joining us today in the track. And again, call to action. That's what you saw in every single one of these presentations. Come together. You have the mailing list. You can always reach out to Georgie and myself. So questions, participation, calls for things that you think we're not addressing. Obviously, we have various ways to solve similar or different problems in very different ways, sometimes in different standards bodies or not. But let's bring that into a more open forum. So reach out and participate. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Thank you. Show's over, folks.